All right, welcome to edition number three of the DREP Book Club. Welcome, everybody. I see a bunch of familiar faces. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the book Reinventing Organizations. Uh, we covered this in a previous book club, but maybe we have all um, had some new experiences or missed the last one. So um, I prepared a new Miro board that kind of goes over the, the basic content. And then we can have some conversations about the book. Um, just a quick show of hands, how many people here have actually read the book? Um, there's two versions, a shorter illustrated one and then a longer, more in-depth one. But, um, I see three or four people. I've, I've read the shorter one. Nice. Yeah, I've, di I've dipped into it. Yeah. Excellent. Um, let me just share the Miro board. So here's the mirror board that we'll be using today. And I'm actually gonna share it so we can look at that. All right, so here's our mirror board. And the book for this week is Reinventing Organizations. Um, just to fly out a little bit um, and give an overview, this is the DREP Education Book Club. It was funded in Fund 9 um, based on a set of books that IOG recommended when you submitted your DREP application form, the reply letter listed four books that they recommend that you read. So um, taking that as kind of a theme, this book club was formed to go over those four books. So far, we've talked about book number one, which wasn't really a book. It was more of a white paper, um, a treasury system for cryptocurrencies that laid out the basic kind of structure and mechanisms for um, Catalyst itself. And then we went to The Power of Experiments by Michael Luca and Max Bazerman, um, and that was last time. And then today we're doing Reinventing Organizations. And then the fourth and final book, which we'll do in about a month, is called Reinventing Discovery by Michael Nielsen. Um, but today we're looking at Reinventing Organizations. Um, this link here, if you haven't read it, um, will take you to a website where you can download um, editions, and I put a PDF of the illustrated version here. So um, this is, you're able to download it and read it if you want um, as a convenience. Um, and then just at a very high level, Reinventing Organizations talks about this model of organizational evolution and it, um, talks about some past and present organization models of the first part of the book, and it kind of carves things out into these levels, which they assign colors to. Um, and the first one um, was the color red, which is the impulsive level. And the major breakthroughs of this kind of level of organization was the division of labor and top-down authority. And it really allowed people to come together and work together as groups. Um, and it really saw organizations kind of like as a wolf pack. And there was a, a single strong leader and everyone else followed. And um, you don't see that as much today, but some current examples might be gangs or criminal syndicates. I'm not sure if there are any legal examples, um, but if anybody has any, please share and post. Um, it'd be interesting to see if anybody sees that kind of stuff happening. And oh, just as a reminder, there are notes down here at the bottom. And these are for you to use to jot down anything and add to the conversation as we go along. So feel free to grab notes and, and do stuff. Um, and then once people started organizing and coming together, the next level that emerged was what they're calling Amber Conformist. Um, and one of the primary breakthroughs for that was to create replicable processes and then a stable organization chart. And it really um, brought a sense of continuity, stability, um, and fixed structures um, to the world where people could rely on this thing um, being understandable and your position in the hierarchy was understood. And um, it allowed for the first time groups and organizations to do longer term planning and to build larger projects beyond what just a small wolf pack kind of organization could do. 
And current examples of this could be the military, religious institutions, and even schools. Um, and it sees organizations as strong fixed structures um, with concrete hierarchies. Um, the next level after that is the orange achievement level. And it came with three breakthroughs. Um, breakthrough number one was innovation. Breakthrough number two is accountability. And breakthrough number three is meritocracy. And its primary mental model is organizations as machines. And this is really kind of the, the capitalistic large corporate model that we see. Um, some really strong examples might be like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and the tech sector. Um, but really any large organization that operates on a meritocracy where anybody can join the company with the proper skills and work their way up through the hierarchy. And it's really individual merit-based. Um, and the organizations as machines, it sees everything as a cog and everything has a specific function and purpose and people are replaceable. Um, they're fungible within these organizations um, because it's role-based, um, not person-based. Um, and then the third one that the book talks about is the green pluralistic level. And it's three breakthroughs are uh, empowerment, values-driven culture, and stakeholder value. Um, and it really sees organizations as families. So this is kind of that next level where you see a lot of corporations now looking to empower their employees and giving them the ability to make decisions um, and you see conversations are on one and two way doors. And if it's a two way door, people are given the freedom to make those decisions. And because you can always take them back or um, they have strong leadership principles and values in place that can help guide the culture of the company. And they really look to increase share stakeholder value, not just um, making the company bigger and stronger. And, and it really sees the organization as a family and everybody inside of it is taken care of is there's a lot of focus on personal development and and really taking care of people as well and it, those organizations tend to be much flatter in hierarchy as well um so those are the past organizational models um laid out in the book and i thought this might be a really good place to just pause and see if people kind of resonate with that do you see that in your kind of in the world, do you agree with the way they kind of broke this down? And really curious on people's thoughts there. And then we'll, once we talk about that, we'll jump into the the actual teal level organizations, which is the next level the book spends most of its time talking about. And I guess a good question might be in your your experience, what kind of organizations have you typically worked for? And um, what were the differences between them? Stephen, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I suppose I'll just throw it out there that my immediate impression is that you get elements of red, amber, and orange and green in in all organizations. So it feels like, you know, sometimes you'll have um someone who is a tyrant in an organization in a particular BT or something. And that would be red or repulsive, and then that may combine with um, emphasis on organisations and machines. And I think we have this; we've had this in the history of Catalyst as well a little bit, like different different approaches, different personalities, and ways of doing things. So it's quite interesting to think of it in that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good point: is that no organisation or is purely one of these levels. It's um, they all build on each other. Like orange can't exist without the amber systems and green can't exist without the orange and, and yellow stuff there. Um, Cause it all builds on, it's on the, these levels. So every organization will show some bits of all of these, but they get stronger and stronger or predominantly are one color. But like Steven said, you could have like a, a red impulsive manager in one department that totally runs their, their group as a, a dictatorship. and. Um, you can see that throughout, but um, yeah, but organizations tend to, on average, pull towards one of these levels. Um, and for myself, I've predominantly worked for a lot of orange organizations moving up through my career. And then towards the tail end, a lot of them started to shift towards some of the, 
the green stuff, um, especially the larger ones with big HR departments and working on Silicon Valley models. Um, I think US West Coast tech kind of turns green a lot. Um, but yeah, anybody else? I'm joking around in the chat, but like one of the one of my toughest scenarios that I find to work in is the one where you're still in the orange organization, but this language of family is being adopted. And I I I just bristle at that language. Um, you know, yes to having human relationships, but the claim that it's a family just feels a little bit misguided to me. You know that uh, I'll, here. Here's my thought, and it's and actually Stephen's, Stephen's sort of original, like the 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 all of them sort of existing in one sort of thing. And we've talked about um, Nora. You and I have talked about how that it's not it's not like a like red is bad, and you're moving towards the good. Um, uh, but they all sort of they kind of uh, assume so they all exist in one one in the organizations, and that's why it sort of pops up. Um, I, but the question of like, when I felt most comfortable, you know, Amber conformist, I felt the most of in the military and, and, for, and strangely in a, uh, theater group, um, it was very like these, the org chart, and it really wasn't about like merit, you know, uh, that the idea of the adding the meritocracy and like who, you know, like, uh, capability and then how those uh how the privilege for instance i was a native i had professor parents and i i spoke with relatively uh clear uh uh english and that that set me like i didn't i didn't have to work hard at that merit and that merit gave me certain things and and i i realized the the problems with that even at a young age yeah so those are some ideas about going through it Mm -hmm. Thanks for those examples. Um, I find it interesting. It was a theater group that was kind of yeah, well. yeah. I was about to say that we were more like a wolf pack because it was because it, but we did have we did have organizational like you know there was a spotlight operator and the guy that ran the the board, uh, the audio board, the lighting board, but it was um, it was such an outcome driven. Like we didn't have time for any any of those shenanigans. It's either the show went on or it didn't, um, and it always did. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good point. The book talks about red impulsive having its place in areas where there's a high degree of uncertainty, chaos. Um, maybe lives are at stake, and you need to yeah. react immediately. They're very good at that. Um, so it could be also like in combat situations, like small groups of soldiers could break down into kind of this wolf pack red kind of level where there's unquestioned loyalty to the the mission or the orders or whatever so but you can also probably see that in some things like um, life-saving operations or different things that go on where where lives are at stake they called that emergent it's interesting because uh, that was a that was a uh, a signifier in the training um uh, emergent leader, meaning that who, who, when things broke down and the organization broke down and blah, 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 like who, who actually did the leadership. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's, that's, it's definitely, it's definitely a thing. Yeah. And as Jeremy said in chat, red equals emergency ethics. And, yeah. And that emergent kind of thing, um, responding to a situation. Um, any other thoughts on the, the past and present organizational models? Um, and thanks for whoever dropped this in um, examples of syndicates, cartels, political parties. Um, all right. So moving on to the, the gist of the book um, is it is tracking and kind of surfacing a new level that seems to be emerging right now. Um, and they're calling it heel or the evolutionary layer. And 
And just as an aside, a lot of this is based on spiral dynamics and the integral theory model of Ken Wilber, kind of all these levels and colors, and um, even the, the evolutionary um, pluralistic achievement conformance impulsive kind of terminology comes from that. Um, but Teal organizations are now starting to emerge, and they have three primary um, breakthroughs that were listed in the book. Um, the first one is self-management. And I took just a, a quick kind of summary note. And what that means is Teal organizations replace traditional hierarchies with, self with a self-organizing system. Employees have high degree of autonomy, and decisions are made collaboratively through consensus or the advice process. Um, and one of the key um, factors that makes this um, possible is the taming of the ego, is how it was stated in the book. Um, the second breakthrough is wholeness. And Teal organizations encourage employees to bring their whole selves to work, recognizing that people have emotional, intellectual, and spiritual dimensions. This involves creating a culture of trust, transparency, authenticity, where people can be themselves and feel valued for who they are. Um, and the key phrase the book talks about here is that people's yearning for wholeness and how organizations can step in and um, help fulfill that, that kind of yearning. And then the third breakthrough is evolutionary purpose. And TL organizations have a sense of purpose that is constantly evolving and adapting to changing circumstances. Rather than having a fixed mission statement, they have guiding purpose that is expressed through the organization's actions and decisions. Um, this involves creating a culture of experimentation and learning where mistakes are seen as opportunities for growth and evolution. Um, and this one is one of the key phrases there was using inner rightness as a compass. Um, and finally, Teal looks at organizations um, not as a hierarchy or a, a mechanism or as families, but organizations as living organisms or living ecosystems. So think more like a, a wild forest where you have trees and ferns and bushes and squirrels. And um, it's, a, it's a thriving ecosystem where everybody kind of contributes, but no one single entity is in charge of it. It kind of self-organizes and self-evolves depending on what's happening. Um, and yeah, and just to kick things off for the discussion, I guess I think this whole self-management bit really made me think about Catalyst and blockchain and DAOs in particular is kind of that self-organization and high degrees of autonomy and no bosses, no managers. Um, and it's something that's fairly new. And um, how do we do that well? And um, and maybe this book gives us some clues through some of these other breakthroughs of wholeness and evolutionary purpose, since I think we're doing one fairly well. Um, and differing degrees of two and three. But i um, really curious to hear what people think um, about Teal at this point. Um, any experiences with Teal? Any thoughts? Yeah, I'd love to hear your, your opinions on this. Ken, you want to kick us off? Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, you, hey, you mentioned um, consensus, but you don't necessarily have consensus when you're talking about like an ecology of of organisms. You have a balance, so that's that's sort of a different different perspective. Like, I'm not sure if you you get can totally get consensus in in just this framework. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm interested in people's opinions on that. Yeah, that's a good point. I actually wrote the wrong word here. I meant to write consent, um, which is actually a little bit different than consent. You, you don't really have, have consent necessarily well like if you're talking about an organization where people choose to join the organization there's some consent consent in that but if you're talking about like an evolutionary system where you've got 
different um, different organisms in an ecology. They don't necessarily have consent, like to being a part of a food chain or something. So, like, I, I guess there's a there's a, a difference there. Um, yeah. So those those, those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Great thoughts. Um, and thank you for that. Anybody have any opinions about that? Um, uh, yeah, I I instantly think about um, consensus in relation. You know, that there isn't any most of the time. <laughs> uh and how that relates to um purpose so if you are considering yourself a part of the organization and um you have some kind of aspiration of collective purpose um how do you how do you how do you how does that purpose form and verbalize itself and establish itself if there is no um if there is no overarching consensus agreement um, um that forms and and even if it if one does form for a period of time the fact that it's evolutionary means that it morphs and changes and when you are when you have a purpose i very much see that as a long term uh you know this is we're, we're crossing the ocean winds may blow us left and right but our ultimate destination is across the ocean. And if that destination changes, that pur that purpose, that, uh, that guiding light, um, as Charles says, then your, um, your chances of getting there or feeling uh, as though you are accomplishing things, if that is not a fixed point, I don't know how you, you, you function almost. It's like, there's, there's very, there's, there's, it's much easier to have, uh, agreements within a small working group to perform some particular task and i think that's where um a lot of this sort of uh, teal stuff actually can can manifest because i yeah I, maybe i'm misunderstanding but it, to me teal feels like it's uh it's a uh, it's an ideal um and that comes about through through uh, an agreement with each other and working together and producing something great but i think that can only really work in a teal organization in a very small pockets or or small pockets that change and morph over time whereas um to find some kind of evolutionary purpose for the whole organization is a much much more transient thing difficult thing um and whether you know we can send send the ship in the right direction or not is down to uh ultimately in inheriting and pulling back some of the features from the the legacy organization types um i that's what i i feel and so teal probably needs to teach me something more about it thanks for that uh stephen yeah i think i was trying to pick up on jonathan there it feels like i'm thinking about the cultural aspect of this where you kind of uh you don't suddenly things don't suddenly unfold you don't you don't we don't find ourselves in life in the beginning as hard as you can say that we, we get thrown into life we get thrown into a kind of um culture and we find ourselves in a culture and in a particular context and this is a way this this is trying to come away one way of trying to understand how we're thrown into different organizations like the wolf pack the, the the strong organizations and i suppose the teal approach it tries to adopt a philosophy in, in relation to the culture um that it finds itself in maybe to try and as i kind of resonate with what you're saying jonathan about a small group almost defensively trying to find a, a refuge if you like um where they can collectively unfold you know collectively evolve and you know I saw that big stick of taming the ego, Norrie. <laughs> so it's like, you know, so where where people could work together in a way rather than succumb to um, the other types of organisations. I don't want to say they're bad organisations because we've said that they may be appropriate for certain things. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, Jonathan, Stephen, you bring up some really good points, and 
the book talks about some example companies and one of them was a uh, kind of this nursing company and it used to have a traditional structure and they were acquired by a, a VC fund or something. And they started implementing like these policies where each nurse only had 10 minutes per patient and they were really output driven and stuff. And they kind of changed it to this teal structure where um, each almost like neighborhood or parts of a city had a nursing group that was small. It was like a eight to 10 people, or I forget the actual size, but it was a small group. And they had total autonomy within that group to say, here are our 20 patients. Here's who's going to be doing it. And they get to decide the treatment. They get to build relationships with their patients. Um, it's not just a random person shows up and gives somebody a shot. They're able to actually visit and talk with these patients and build a relationship and decide how best to care for them. And they really push those decisions from corporate down to the actually the frontline small groups that were doing the nursing and it evolved to a point where the core kind of headquartered team became a very very small team and it really just kind of maintained the the structures needed to connect everything together but there was so much autonomy pushed to the small local team so i think that is one of the keys is um, people work together really well in small groups so how do we foster small groups and yet kind of connect them with some kind of a, a network or a purpose that makes it into a larger organization. Yes, I think, hmm, I think the, the organizations that we are trying to, to create currently are out of the scope of, of the, the traditional way of thinking you can you can see that in for example when you you try to 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 work on 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 tools like canva for example like canvas this structure full of uh, squares and directions and all these tools uh, uh, try to try to provide some help in organizing the, the, the thinking around how to how to reflect about an organization, and we are doing this uh, that kind of exercise yesterday. And when you try to, to 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 think in a purpose, in a thing like a purpose or a mission, a collective mission, you can find a right place to 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 put this 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 mission or this purpose. In, in that Canva, for example, in, in that canvas, or in many other tools that you have at disposition. But I think that tools were made to the to the transient world in which you lived. And today, the, the, to the organizations, the today's organizations in which we can, we can give life to a purpose are really different in all sense, in many senses. Okay. That's mm -hmm. Thanks for that contribution, Sebastian. I totally agree. Um, um, Jonathan, and then James. Uh, yeah, and just sort of came out a little bit aside, but thinking about the the legacy organization structure types that we have, and um, how actually a lot of the the effort and endeavors are done now by. Uh, people outside of organizations, so contractors, freelancers, um, consultants will come in and form part of a functional working group for a period of time on a particular project and get a whole load of the, the traction and actual you know, value creation done. And then their uh, contract ends, they drift off, and that, um, uh, that momentum can be lost from that group quite quick, quite quickly. And you know, there's a there's a significant part of that's ultimately down to um, uh, budget and revenues, and you know what's not ma money making gets gets uh, lost. And so, actually, if we can have, um, like I think Jeremy was saying about capturing the uh, the data in a vote to reach consent, it's very much in a similar way. You want to capture the value in a working group um, um, prior to the and then this you know in this. I agree. You've got the vote being the the 
ultimately the budget decides <laughs> you know that's that's the that's the result of the votes is out of the budget um decision making and so actually you know there's a whole lot of value that's there and if the you know the cringy family part the relationship the uh the stuff can actually be given uh, a long-term place to to show up i think that would that would be a real valuable thing to bring from teal because you know i think of um organizations i've worked with over long periods of time always as a an external you know, supplier um i actually end up with more knowledge and um and and you know history of their organization than and anybody in the organization because there's staff churn there's uh projects information lost and it only resides then in that third party so actually a lot of the value is is external to the organization anyway so <laughs> teal and and they'll come and ask questions you know new new managers will come and ask questions of well who was supplier at the time okay it's these guys what's what what we what were we doing here what were we thinking <laughs> Um, and so, you know, Teal then, if we can uh, have this this feed, this input, because I don't have any say ultimately in purpose of that organization, but surely I should have it having being the, the holder of the knowledge. <laughs> so, yeah, that sort of stuff comes into it as well. Go on, James. <laughs> uh, that's, that's really interesting, John. And I threw my hand up when I was looking at Jeremy's and Stephen's comments in the chat just about decision making and and what information we have when we're when we're delving into governance and and John, that's a perfect example, right? Like it comes down to how are we going to use the resources we have. But that's really that that concept of right, who even knows who holds the information is really interesting especially in, in those kind of like loose collectives of consultants and contributors ways of doing things. Um, but all this, you know, all of that connects to a maybe distributed ledger part. And one of the one of the moments in the book that threw me for a little bit of a loop is in the striving for wholeness chapter, where kind of as like an afterthought, he talks about how a lot of these teal organizations don't have multiple bottom line metrics. And that was a little bit surprising to me, right? So this, this concept that we can measure not only our profits, but we can also measure, you know, in some other quantifiable way, our progress towards these other outcomes that we, we seek, right? Whether it's a social impact metric, or an environmental metric. These organizations don't do that. And I and if I had to guess without reading the book, I would have been like, oh yeah, multiple bottom lines. That's that's probably a feature of teal organizations. And first to hear that it's not, and then to reflect on, well, heavens, these these distributed ledgers that we're starting to work with kind of point us in that direction of maybe measuring other things and having a public record that we can use for shared decision making. I was feeling a little bit of tension between those things and I haven't resolved it for myself yet, but just just wondering how people make sense of that idea of, because I know this, I, I know it from experience. When you start to measure anything, your behavior about that thing changes, right? If our If our organization had an environmental goal, it would lead to some weird outcomes that were not intended. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering like how much, how much credence to give this concept of, hey, evolutionary organizations can really stick just to the profit part and maybe not measure certain things, but that the corollary is somebody knows these things, right? It's, it's part of the spirit of the organization that's just always embedded in decision making and in the kinds of blockchain distributed ledger things we're doing how much what goes what goes on chain and how do we how do we reckon for all the things that are not on chain but are going to be part of people's decision making thanks james i think that's a really interesting point um and something i was 
I'm surprised wasn't brought up. I think I'm just dropping a link into chat, but like a lot of groups that I work with in the permaculture or impact space talk about different forms of capital. And there are many systems. There's like eight forms of capital and not a system has 10 or 12. And, um, but they basically all point to like one of that, those eight or 10 as the financial capital. And then there's so many other things that have value um, that don't show up on your bottom line that don't impact your stock price. Um, but perhaps if you increase them and you talk about like experiential capital, intellectual capital, um, cultural capital, if you are really good at those things and have a lot of it, you'll naturally be more successful. You'll bring more value to the world and that'll be reflected in the, the financial bottom line. Um, but yeah, I don't see it's not common to measure those things on spreadsheets and, and do that. And as Jeremy said, maybe it, it's not helpful to do that. I mean, you're, you're mentioning types of capital reminds me, I can't remember who said it, that um, in the finance, when, there's, when you just think of capital in financial terms, uh, the, the, those who have proximity to finance have the advantage. You know, so and I remember working in investment banking, you know, the, the traders, the fund managers, they were, they benefit from financial capital above anyone else, <laughs> you know, because they have that proximity to capital. So if you think of capital in other ways, which is interesting, like social capital, other types of capital, other kinds of meaning, and you, that is a way of helping maybe rethink what economics means, you know, and what value means, you know, so that's really useful. And James's other point about blockchain as being a tool where maybe we can start to experiment with some of these and having a way of showing it where before it's kind of this invisible kind of capital, but through like participation tokens or um, NFT credentials or whatever it is, we have the tools now to go beyond just kind of our standard um, QuickBooks or whatever accounting systems to measure money in and out and expense and revenues. There's other things that we can be measuring, giving out, distributing. Um, and that I think is a super interesting kind of proposition that's unique to our space, which other TL organizations probably don't have access to yet if they're not in the blockchain area. I love the idea of earning a whole load of spiritual capital that results in a fat wad, wad of tokens in my wallet and then going to a DEX and swapping them for food. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> 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 it's like taking a, a loan in. Um, I just desperately need some kind of moral purpose for a while. Can I, can I, can I get it off the DEX? <laughs> so I want you to know, I want you to know that my very first internet friend and he was like, I was like, yeah, I want to build a thing. I want to build a website and stuff. He's just like, we got to sell souls on the website. There's going to be a button that says sell your soul. And then and then it's like, that's going to be the best. It's like, where can we sell a soul on the internet? And, it, you know, he's a great guy, James Miller. <laughs> Liquidity. Uh, the, 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 the capital, uh, the eight types of capital is definitely like a, a big uh, game, uh, game changer, definitely shifted uh my thinking on it and um and i think steven just mentioned it the sort of idea of economics um like this you know not just financial economics but social economics and uh i guess which is what sociology is it's like mass movements and how like all the stuff um fits together as far as like in groups of people um similarly politics uh, you know, it's I kind of have like a real narrow definition of politics and, and governance. I, all these things have become really expansive. I see governance everywhere now. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the in the in the everyday design of stuff that we use, like there's governance. Like we're using t uh, Zoom here. Like somebody made the decision to do this and to do that. And that has to do with governance. And when it, when, uh, what John was saying about like, what exactly is the goal? Uh, you know, what exactly is the purpose? And those things get tried and tested because 
you make a, a decision, you know, and I guess it's kind of trite or cliche, but you can make money or you can make a quality product. And, and decisions are made every day to make more money or to choose this type of value versus that type of value. And the consequences of those is real, like in my mind, real governance. And, and it's not as, uh, you know, it's, it's not as, uh, it's very big gray area. Uh, but it, it's definitely, um, it's been edifying. It's been gratifying uh, in, in my experience with the whole Catalyst uh, 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 and this Teal organizational thing uh, uh, that's been going on. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, just quickly on, on that. In particular, it's very easy for decisions, uh, governance decisions, or what should be governance decisions, to be made by the ease of adoption of a particular uh you know direction so zoom is easier it has less bugs than discord for group group video calls so we go to zoom and that's a government decision made by then uh the organization just oh, we, we just got to get go on with stuff and so stuff happens um and there's all sorts of parallels with that all the way up any organization and and actually, if you want to hit your purpose, often, you know, our purpose may be decentralization. And so actually using Zoom is the exact opposite of that. How do we <laughs> how do we hit our North Star of decentralization when actually it's far easier just to use all the centralized solutions out there? Yeah, let's have a meeting on Zoom and post the recording to YouTube. No big deal. <laughs> That's decentralized, right? <laughs> well, those are the so those are like uh those are sort of what we've kind of, uh, it's like uh, this, the coalesced or, or sort of consensus is another, maybe that's a different term of like, okay, we've just sort of gotten a standard process. Um, that's why I like, and maybe it fits in here. It's just like where, when we recognize those and then there is a part of the process where you bust it up and say, okay, we're, we're you know, it's not oppositional or contrarian, or maybe those sort of fit in that sort of zone of like recognizing when there is a rut or when there is a standard and then there is that element. And I think that has to do with the wholeness because certain people are contrarian. They love to like go buck against the grain. There's certain people that have the, the other sort of design attribute and that they like to find, I've, I'm sort of one of those that likes to find the consensus, the, the sort of norm, uh, the, the, the sort of easy thing. And uh, both of those folks need to be in balance or, or, or brought and supported in, you know, uh, living sort of ecosystems. Um, yeah, yeah. I kind, of, I kind of, that echoes with me a little bit, Newman, because I'm thinking of um, the downsides of an evolutionary approach. Well, evolution, okay, survival of the fittest, is that what we want? Um, will that lead to, lead to the iron law of oligarchy? You know where basically people interested in governance will be a minority so then you just just leave it to those few people and you end up with a non-oligarchy the same with self-sovereignty you know who has the strength to be self-sovereign you know who, who has that the resilience the robustness to be anti-fragile you know that's all very well saying that but who does you know so maybe it's better to think as well or as well as is to think about interconnectedness you know relying on other people yeah, that's really hard relying on other people, but you need to rely on other people, <laughs> you know. And then that, when you start relying on other people, that starts you thinking about capability, different levels of capability, not different types of capability that some people know about shit that you don't know about. <laughs> and, you know, and you have to work with them because they're all interrelated. They're not all, yes, they are sovereign, but only in one dimension. Not everyone is an individual. You know, if everyone was an individual, then they could just go off and light a campfire somewhere. But that's not what we do, you know. So, <laughs> I think that's exactly that's exactly it. Uh, you know, um, the 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 self, but there there's got to be sort of in the maybe in that self management thing of self sovereign, but at the same time interdependent, um, and in some and then like that that the single dimensionality of like what uh 
uh, like a like a natural ecosystem of you know predator prey and soil and context like how all those little pieces and they develop together so that's i think that could be that could be part of that evolutionary process not necessarily survival of the fittest um but survival of of everything together like an ecosystem like it, it, it uh evolution not from the species but evolution in the in the ecosystem frame, maybe. There's a, a book I put down here in the resources section. Oh, by the way, this area is for anybody to drop links or articles or anything that support our conversation. Feel free to drop it in. I seeded it with a few. Um, there's one here about Sociocracy 3.0, which I think is a it's an open source um, evolution of sociocracy, holacracy and um a few other things um and i think it, it's a, a really good example of a teal operating system for an organization um but i wanted to refer to this book called brave new work um and in it the author talks about teal organizations and talks about a whole bunch of processes and different ways different companies are are doing it and um his whole thing was being teal organizations are people positive and complexity conscious um, and he goes through those two lenses to look at at teal. Um, and that gets to kind of that people side. It's, it's important to be people positive and to encourage the relationships and the working together and those kind of mechanisms. And then complexity conscious just means that um, there's com there's um, complicated and complex. And complicated can be hard, but you can eventually figure it out. A car engine is complicated, but complexity is something that spiral so fast out of control that you can't judge where it's going or control it um, at best you can nudge it in a certain direction and um, he says when you're working in teal you're complexity conscious so that you don't assume that you're ever going to figure this out and have a solid plan but you need to be able to react as you nudge things along and and kind of move things along so i thought that was an interesting evolution to the thought in this book called brave new work so i just want to throw that in there for people if you're curious um, but it might be a good time since we're right at the last 12 minutes to move into the final piece. Um, I found it interesting that IOG recommended this book for DREPs. Um, and, and it's been fun talking about it. And I love this book and the concepts in it. But uh, maybe bringing it back to Catalyst, like what does self-management, what might self-management mean in Catalyst? Or what might wholeness mean in Catalyst? Or evolutionary purpose? and what does all this mean for DREPs? Um, is there a way that we can use these ideas or concepts to help steer and nudge things in this complex system that we're kind of all engaged in? I'll, I'll jump in. I'd love to talk. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but and, uh, D reps, it seems like, are are complexity conscious simply because whereas like an older style representative because of the 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 term limit like you know four years or or you know like uh, the the staticness of the delegation, but when there's a dynamic delegation where they can it can sort of happen you know at, at any time, um, that feels like to me it the the system itself is complexity conscious because it it understands that there's not just all blocks like in the united states right now there's just republican and democrat and uh you know red or blue it doesn't there's not a lot of like complexity consciousness so maybe that is one of those things that's baked into the new DREP catalyst thing yeah but i suppose then, yeah. yeah sorry the I suppose I'm thinking from the perspective of the analysis we did on, uh, I think with Kemrick and others on uh, voting systems and DREP, the plutocratic voting system. So maybe it's like where the you know the rock meets the hard place in. Or <laughs> it's like you, yes, you have all these intentions, but okay, you're having you're, you're inviting DREPs and you're vetting them. Who's doing that? And you know they're coming along who are they representing what is the nature of representation there you know um who's going to delegate to them if it's going to be on a plutocratic basis 
what how does that play out in terms of um voting systems you know so is it going to just favor wales or is it going to be a popularity contest um how and how and then i suppose the bigger question is how do you design how do you have a deterministic a logarithmic system that's going to support that in any way how is it going to be mitigated in social choice terms so this is where we reach the problems the hard problems of you know how do you translate these ideals into blockchain machine you know how do you make it run on the machine i suppose and to be fair to cardano and catas i think they're trying i think that <laughs> but this is a bit flawed and i'm not blaming them because it's flawed it's going to be flawed to begin with but it has some big flaws mm -hmm. i think that's a really great point when you're talking about a one coin one vote kind of one token one vote system um how does all this come in but looking at self-management um that speaks to kind of emergent organization so rather than d reps being these discrete entities that you delegate to is there opportunity here for communities of d reps or communities that act as d reps that can do some kind of sensing of the problem space and and kind of enact through the DREP process the intent of the original catalyst circle to be a sensing mechanism and to help make decisions. Maybe there's something here that could happen or um, just some thoughts there. And then, yeah, wholeness and evolutionary purpose. Um, yeah, totally open to what people think that might apply. But um, I think the self-management piece could play in if we start to as a community add layers on top of the the blockchain mechanisms of dreps and um there may be opportunity there to really self-organize and self-manage without iog dictating this is what dreps should do um the mechanisms there but we can self-organize and create different um mechanisms or processes around that that are are more powerful and more people positive maybe complexity conscious. Well, well, it's it's really the blockchain technology. Um, and then big, big thanks to uh, Gimbal Labs for the um, for the instruction where this, this, these tools, these apps, these um, datum on inside can be so specific, they could just say, if this person holds this token, then they they vote my vote. And it can be down to that very uh, granular, complex thing. So it's all the sort of affordances of the new technology, um, and then trying to figure out like exactly how uh, you know you know how that gets translated. Uh, and then I'm really thankful for folks that are are government aware enough to say, "Hey, look, the way you're doing it is going to get us right back into the same spot." Which is Stephen, what I. What I'm sort of that's what I I sense. You're like, look, if you do these things, same with um, same with Jeremy, that you know that are very that have have a uh, a schema. They have an understanding. So when this new knowledge comes in, and it, it and it doesn't have the idealism of sort of new technology tool. Look what we can do. Um, yeah. So I, I guess that's I guess there's. There's there's a there's new affordances inside of the technology um, that we're trying to work through, um, and then but then it's that agency that sort of self sovereignty that self management of saying oh no I have uh, and wholeness where you can you can bring those up because of the your education and your experiences and be able to like uh, uh, affect you know, participate in the governance to bring on this new thing. Um, I can see it, I can see it working. And, you know, these terms are making sense from my perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think it's a hard question. I don't want to create the I think experiments need to be run. I'm also contrasting here a catalyst 
this D reps with the uh, 1694 D reps are a very different beast, you know, and um, the Catalyst D reps, um, they go, well, the intention is to attempt some kind of mitigation of plutocratic voting. So um, it does have that context, which, which may be more amenable to Teal, uh, if you think of it in that way. Um, I suppose then the, if you look at it in the broader picture at the moment, there's a lot of discussions of, of going to the consensus level, like is proof of stake itself the wrong way? <laughs> okay, is that taking us towards centralization, for example? That's a big question. And then there's other consensus protocols um, like proof of reputation or contribution systems, and that raises similar problems because it may be a solution to the consensus model that you need for a blockchain but then you find yourself maybe going down a social credit route, you know? Mm -hmm. So yes, there are technological solutions, but they're not, they can lead you down different paradigms and they lead you down to different challenges and different problems. Right. Um, so it's really interesting, actually. That's part of maybe I think why a lot of us are here, actually. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Ken? Yeah, like... What we're doing as a group is we're exploring like a system space of all the possible directions that the Catalyst or Cardano can go. And so like earlier we were talking about like taking the easy path, like using Zoom and using YouTube is an easy path. It may not be the optimal path, and I think that ties in directly with the idea of being able to run multiple experiments. So like if, if you have the way that things are done by most people and then someone wants to try something new, you need some, some way to, to encourage the, the process of building up a, a competing way of doing something um, that people might not accept as the right way to do things at first, but if someone's got a good idea and they're, they're willing to put in the time and effort, having some way to support that effort and get to the point where people see the value of whatever contribution each person is trying to bring to the table. I like that. And also gets to the wholeness bit of this is like when everyone can bring something to the table. Um, I think that the outcomes are much stronger than having just a select few with the desired qualities or attributes participating. Well, it's even the, the majority, like if the majority has, has a path that they're taking and someone wants to bring something that that goes in a different direction how do you how do you run the experiments to see what the merits of that perspective are mm -hmm. and that gets to like our previous book club was talking about the power of experiments um and i think that's a key piece of anything we're doing um, is how do we encourage experimentation and making hypotheses and then giving people the chance to test them and then saying yes or no, did the hypotheses pan out? And if yes, then maybe we give them a little more support or it'll help other people say, oh my God, this actually kind of works. Maybe we can do these other experiments. So I think, and that's kind of, what catalyst espouses itself to be or do so i think we should be able to figure out a way to really enable that to happen through um this so i think having d reps be mindful of that um maybe there's some mechanism there where we can really look at those outlier ideas that might be kind of crazy but they might be worth small bets um, just to see what happens and to test their hypotheses and yeah, maybe that's how proposals should happen as somebody makes a hypothesis and describes how they're going to run the experiment and then you get funding for that. Um, 
that might be an interesting kind of al alternative to how we do proposals. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think I just sort of clued back in because yeah, it's it is um, like everyone bringing wholeness, everyone bringing something to the table, and then uh, like feeling in this new mindset. Whereas in the old mindset, they sort of like you have a proposal, it doesn't work out, and you hide that. Um, uh, in a new way, it's just like no, it's I can I can I can be vulnerable, or I can bring my whole thing. It was it was this, and the, and that the the data is still valid. That all mm -hmm. of this valid data, we're not like just like pushing under the rug. Because what happens is when you when you when you think of that in an economic model, you get no negative feedback until it's way too late because it's it's you can't stuff it in the closet you can't hide it under the bed anymore and then it just now now it's now it appears that there's nothing but negative you know res, uh you know uh, negative uh response um yeah that 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 transparency that goes along with it vulnerability is also a word that goes along with it um i wrote down I wrote down earlier uh, under the wholeness, Mr. Green and the snow job. I had a fifth grade teacher at Catholic school and he was, and we would just lie about everything, nothing. We never fessed up to sh no, nothing, nothing. We saw nothing, we know nothing. And he was so angry. He was just like, you're just snow jobbing. It's just a snow job. You're just, you're just putting up a big white wall to everything, you know? And it was just hilarious. He, we battled, we battled. He was great. He was one of my only male teachers in elementary school, Mr. Green. Beautiful. Um, I am conscious of the time. We're at the top of the hour um, and people are starting to drop off. So um, I really, I'll wrap this up here um, and give the YouTube viewers a break so you're not watching a, a super long YouTube video. But um, thanks everybody for coming today and participating in the DRET Book Club, discussing reinventing organizations. Um, mirror boards open. I'll leave it open for um any additional thoughts links whatever you want to share um please do take a look at these resources um there's some in dropped in and i came across this and this was really interesting as a kind of just an overall if you look at how the different levels deal with decision making or personnel development or meetings or work attitude work climate loyalty um it's really it can show the evolution of these kinds of things and maybe you can map out where you your organization is at and where it could possibly grow um but that was kind of a an interesting thing that i uncovered while i was researching for this uh book club um so please do avail yourself if you have any resources or links that might be shareable please drop them in here as well because um this is a long living mural board and um, hopefully it'll be a, a resource for people who are interested in and taking a look at um, reinventing organizations and the concepts in there. All right. So with that, I just want to say thanks, everybody, for participating today. And um, next book will be Reinventing Discovery by Michael Nielsen. So I'll post that to the different channels, and we'll probably discuss it in a month or so. So yeah, thanks, everybody, for showing up today. And Thank you, Nuri. Yeah. Have a really Thank great you. Day.